Good evening, the Dark Ozark. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hey, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good evening. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good night to talk about spooky stuff here on the Dark Ozarks. It it is dark dark tale dark fairy tales particular fairy tales in the sense of fairy tales that we grew up with and and uh, how they relate to the Ozarks and haunted mines, which there's a little bit of connection between the two of that. So there are and some uh, connections with the uh with a variety of mines you know the fact that there's there's more types of mines than you might imagine and uh, some really unique phenomena that are associated with some of them particularly in arkansas it's going to be a fun night uh, it is that, that said we have a great sponsor and some events coming up yes we do uh shout out to always buying books in joplin missouri um Bob and Elise do a wonderful job. We really appreciate them supporting the video cast and podcast, as well as sponsoring the upcoming event at um, October Country, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but um, it's not just for us to be appreciative. Um, we invite everyone to check out their inventory. Uh, it's amazing. If you're in the area, stop in at the store on North Main Street in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, if you're not, uh, check them out online. Their website is alwaysbuyingbooks.com and on Facebook, Always Buying Books, as well as their group, uh, friends who like Always Buying Books. A lot of inventory is listed there. You can purchase it and have it mailed to you. So there's no excuse not uh, finding what you want. Everything from general reading, genre material to uh, very uh, hard to find nonfiction topics and high end collectibles. 100%. <clears throat> of course, uh, here's a book that I just got in yep. <laughs> Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, it's a good book, too. It is an excellent book. Happy to say, now, I, I don't think that I'm alone uh, on this uh, in the fact that I, I do have a, uh, a bit of a habit. Mm -hmm. of collecting stacks of books and then not reading them no that that never happens <laughs> uh but we will <clears throat> i'm i'm putting this out into the into the public reality i'm holding myself to a, a a higher level of accountability of actually reading the books that i buy and i'm happy to say that i have just finished uh midnight in the garden of good and evil uh finished another book and i'm now deciding which of the books that I purchased at uh, Always Buying Books in Joplin in late June uh, is going to be next. There you go. And then we have some interesting things coming up. We do. Uh, first out of the gate for public events in association with Dark Ozarks is State of the Ozarks Fest, which is going to be Saturday, September 17th, all day, and downtown historic Hollister. Dark Ozarks mm -hmm. will be there set up with books. Uh, Lisa, you'll be there. Of course, I will yeah. be there. I'm also hosting the entire festival. And uh, for, for a general uh, sense of the festival itself, <clears throat> At a minimum, we see to four to four to five thousand people at the street festival. There will be about a hundred different um, uh, separate vendors, uh, some very uniquely curated uh, vendors with uh, Ozarks uh, artisans, uh, cosplay, Civil War reenactors, as well as uh, medieval combat. You know, you can't get more eclectic than that. So <laughs> it's just fun. It always is. Um, I can say that. Uh, handedly having been there <laughs> everyone so far so yes uh, yes and um, a picturesque setting in downtown Hollister so, you know you can you can just forget the world and think that you're in an old English village and um, it's even better so it really is <clears throat> And I think that's a lot of fun and, and uh, some great, great food. There's going to be some fantastic food downtown. Uh, many, many uh, 
folks do come to State of the Ozarks Fest and are introduced to uh, our, our restaurants for the first time and are oftentimes surprised that for a town as small as Hollister, uh, only around 4,000 people in the town, that we have some really, really, um, I, I would say, you know, national, national level uh, cuisine and uh, some fine restaurants. I agree. I, I agree. Some of my favorite restaurants are there. So, <laughs> so make plans for that, and then <clears throat> we're going to be in Kansas. Yes, we're we we are not in Kansas now, but we will be. Um, <laughs> uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but we're going back. But um, we will. Uh, September 24th, uh, Caney, Kansas, which actually is in what's what's known as the Little Ozarks. Mm -hmm. And for the Border Town Paracon put on by SCK uh, Paranormal. And you can check out their website and their Facebook page for details. Uh, we'll be presenting on a variety of topics and mm -hmm. uh, it's a event. It's uh, uh, free for the public and food. Will be there etc so check it out and then october 7th we will be back in hollister yes um <clears throat> tickets will be available shortly for a, a haunted walking tour as well as a tour of the old english inn our historic hotel which is quite haunted yes. and uh, it's going to be a really really neat night it will be in conjunction with state of the ozarks first friday art walk and there's going to be a lot of things going on downtown that night so make plans to uh to be back in hollister on october 7th and you can count you can come in costume we are yeah <laughs> <laughs> we invite you now I, I'm, I'm gonna say <clears throat> and i i've experienced this as well uh nothing is 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 more um frightening to our herd mammal brain than the possibility of showing up in costume and being the only one uh, but we promise we will be in period costume and we do invite others uh to to come in in period costume or cosplay uh or a mixed match of both it is going to be the kickoff of the uh, uh hollister um pardon me hollister halloween season mm -hmm. and uh we're going to be encouraging uh, many of the folks there to to come in costume or in cosplay and just have a great time. That's right. And then um, on the 15th of October, we will be in Joplin. Uh, yes. We will um, be at the BFW Post uh, 534 for uh, Dark Ozarts October Country, which is a day-long event covering a, a plethora of topics under our, our, our umbrella of dark tales history and the paranormal uh, mm -hmm. there be refreshments and other things to enjoy so tickets are available those are up now um other the other event will be later tonight um paranormalsciencelab.com um and tickets are are starting to to go there um so uh, get your tickets and come out and enjoy Absolutely. And, and we should say it's an interactive event that it's not mm -hmm. it's not a matter of talking heads. Um, uh, the audience gets involved and that's some of the best part of it. It is. It is. We get to learn a lot of great stuff from you all and uh, just have a lot of fun as a whole. Yes. And then um, on the 20th, we will be back in Joplin for the um, old Joplin downtown walking tour. Uh, which covers history and ghost tales of old Joplin. Um, yeah. And that's in conjunction with the Third Thursday Art Walk in Joplin. Um, we're, we're doing that with the Joplin Downtown Alliance, which um, does a lot of community uh, projects and, and work that is um, uh, important for preserving history and community, including being uh, one of the principals in the renovation of the uh, Olivia. Of the Olivia, which yes. <clears throat> coming uh, just in terms of some potential conjecture, but there's so much 
uh, of Joplin that is over caves and over mysterious holes in the ground uh, yes. <laughs> in the mining district. And I really think that some of that subterranean uh, mystery definitely associates with the Olivia and some of the magic that is 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 there. Oh, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, so that's going to be a good time. Tickets again are on sale at paranormalsciencelab.com. Uh, and then on the 29th, we will be in Newtonia for an uh, event at the Ritchie Mansion and the Civil War Cemetery. And it's it's turning into quite an event. There's going to be food. There's going to be all kinds of things going on. So even if you were there one of the other two times we put this event on, it's going to be a bigger event. I'm not even sure how big it's going to be with what all is going to be going on yet. So um, it is uh, really one of my favorite things that we get to do. Mine as well. And it's, it's some really neat um, shifts of history. If you're interested in attending these events, each one of these events is going to be drastically different than the other based on the history and the location. And uh, especially <clears throat> finishing off with the, uh, the event at Newtonia on the 29th. Uh, the 28th is actually the anniversary of the battle. Yes. And then it is also just a couple of days before Halloween. That's true. Uh, so perfect timing and a lot of fun. And then one that we just added to the calendar, November 19th, we will be at the Web City Library, um, which is a great, and you have not been there for a have, have you? I have um, not. It is a great um, place to um, investigate and for the tour. People might say, why a library? Well, it is haunted and it has been haunted virtually since the day it opened. Um, and uh, with lots of poltergeist activity and full body apparitions. So uh, that is also going on uh, website for tickets later tonight. So it's mm -hmm. always a good event and, it ha and proceeds uh, also benefit the library. And they use that for different uh, programs for children, etc. So. Yes, and I think that's is is really important. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I really love uh, these types of events because not only does it bring attention to these historic locations, but in many cases, a, a great deal of the the ticket sales go to to support the structure itself and uh, the hardworking folks who typically are functioning in, on volunteer time exactly exactly and you know although the yes the, the library is funded and everything you know uh funding is tight all the way around and so the programs like this just make it easier to for them to put on more events for the community uh, educational events um, for the something that I've always felt good about participating in. 100%. Uh, also, a uh, quick note on uh, Facebook subscribers. It's a new option that is available. Folks can uh, sign up. It basically functions like Patreon, and then you get exclusive behind-the-scenes uh, <clears throat> stuff. Uh, oftentimes, in the case of really getting off the cuff, uh, short, deep dives on a variety of lore, uh, things about paranormal investigation, how to's, etc. that uh, is, is a lot of fun. So we do encourage people to uh, uh, try that out. That's right. And if you would rather, if you would rather uh, experience uh, the podcast, go to bransonpodcastnetwork.com uh, and Dark Ozarks is now available there as well. Yes. Yes, it is. So <clears throat> lots and lots and lots of places to check out Dark Ozarks and follow us either uh, virtually uh, on social media or in person. And now Dark Tales. That is if we don't lose Josh. <laughs> as long as Josh here. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, there's there's a lot of uh, really creepy tales associated with tonight's topics. Uh, started between some of the German folklore that was brought into the region, uh, some of the unique uh, geological features of the region itself, and then uh, the mines. Oftentimes we talk about caves, but in this in this particular case, we're talking about mines, especially in the aptly named Tri-State Mining District, which the, the center of the Tri-State Mining District really is Joplin. Yeah, yes. But we're, but we're going to touch on other areas as well. So. It's... <clears throat> Where do you want yeah. to start? Where do you want to start? Mm. Let's. Uh, I like the idea of starting with uh, with some German uh, German immigration and German folklore. Okay, sounds good to me. I think that uh, certainly it's something that is is ingrained within our psyche predominantly through the Grimm's fairy tales and then many of the Disney adaptations during the 20th century of the Grimm fairy tales and at the same time it's these were not originally uh, stories for children they were the stories of a people in central yeah. Europe uh, and in many cases they they were uh, encoded stories to do a variety of things. One, obviously, to, to um, preserve a, a people group's culture. Mm -hmm. uh, two, to try to make structure out of the structureless, essentially to help explain the inexplicable, help to explain tragedy, help to explain danger, help to explain the unknown in ways that, of course, children would begin to learn but with the understanding that we're not talking about children's programming, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, a, a substrate way of understanding the world. Yes, and in, in context, and, and this is something that I, I think most people really aren't aware of because it really never gets taught even in world history classes, um, that this part of Europe particularly, you know, uh, Germany um, and Central Europe experienced uh, deprivation in the 14th century that uh, goes beyond what most people can fathom. Um, yeah. the, the Great Famine, um, we often hear about the Irish Famine and it was horrible, but um, yeah. the Great Famine of Central Europe was actually much worse to the point of the reason you had stories of Hansel and Gretel was there was cannibalism. There were it, people did leave their children in the forest to die because they there was no way to feed everybody. Um, yeah. uh, people making choices and 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 decisions that normally no one would ever contemplate. And so that's where these these fairy, what we call fairy tales, uh, came out of. They did. <clears throat> they really did. And, and along with that, along with that, <clears throat> you also have really encoded, encoded lessons that are designed to help a, a culture uh, survive. Yes. So. And, and traces of it are, are found in, in tales in the Ozarks even now. They are. They are. Uh, I'm going to let you roll with that point for just a moment. And okay. I'm going to take care of a noisy boy. Okay. Um, and, you know, basically, we, we, often, we often think of settlement in the Ozarks as being... Uh, English settlers coming from uh, the colonies on the Atlantic seaboard um, or uh, first, second generation uh, Americans. Uh, but there were a series of immigration waves and uh, even predating what we're gonna talk about. Uh, you had the French and um, the Creoles actually um, 
settled in eastern uh, Missouri uh, that people don't really think about. We think of Creole, you know, Creole culture being in Louisiana, but um, basically came south from Canada, uh, settled in the early 1700s. There were uh, some Spanish um, encampments um, when it was Spanish land. Um, and then we had waves of uh, settlers, including the Scotch Irish. We had Germanic uh, uh, influx of uh, Germanic um, uh, ancestry uh, from, to begin with, the Pennsylvania Dutch coming through, and then later settlers coming through from Germany in the 1840s after the Prussian Wars. So that's basically where I got. It's uh, it's good, and it's uh, it's a complex complex layers of settlement and complex layers of immigration. It's honestly when when you parse it out, realistically, it's a bit of a surprise that uh, Amer American settlement, even amongst the settlers, was as peaceful as it actually was. That's true. I mean, um, a lot of overlapping and crisscrossing, and and. Um, uh, struggling to establish themselves in new territory so uh it, it really is and it's it is a complex subject but um what would you say some of the uh shared traits of of the germanic lore uh that survive in the ozarks is <clears throat> It's a really good question. I, I think that that as a base, <clears throat> a fear of the dark things of the forest, mm -hmm. uh, a fear of the dark places, and of course that includes caves and mines. Yes. The 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 underlying sense, and some people could call it uh, more of a primal intelligence. Other people would call it superstition, but the sense that there are dangerous things and that if we don't respect those spaces uh we may regret it exactly and you really don't know what's in the forest or in the dark um and um that that carries through in a lot a lot of tales i i think for me i see it a lot in the the stories of the isolated cabins um, yes, including like phantom cabins, and um, of course we've got a lot of tales of traveling, tra usually traveling salesmen meeting grizzly inns. Um, <laughs> very reminiscent <laughs> of of those Germanic fairy tales, um, and I think that um, if you want to look at a particular place that is sort of very um, in, emblematic of that would be probably uh, the Irish wilderness, uh, which uh, for people in the Ozarks that know the story, it's very captivating, but very few people really know the story, um, which is a settlement that um, was deep in the woods um, in Southeast Missouri, settled by a group of um, Catholic immigrants uh, from, uh, Irish St. Louis uh, settled shortly before the Civil War and during the Civil War simply disappeared um, with no trace found, um, no survivors, no one showing up anywhere. Um, and various theories of how they met their demise during the war at the hands of soldiers or bushwhackers or sundry other things um, mm -hmm. and it's a real event but the the imagery it evokes you know is no different than um huntsman stories and uh, hansel and gretel and even red riding hood <laughs> things like that yeah. i mean it's very very much um in the same vein and it carries that kind of mystique even today. People are just captivated and 
they're captivated, but also a bit um, put off and uneasy uh, with the Irish wilderness because you there are no there are no answers. No, <clears throat> history really does. History provides a number of potential clues uh, and certainly some conjecture, but in terms of a verified answer, it does not. And having uh, driven through the, uh, the the region of the Irish. Irish wilderness mm -hmm. uh, back in March, uh, it, it is still very remote and it does, <clears throat> you know, very easily begin to conjure up those, those, those ideas of a, uh, of a dark and dangerous forest. Now, there's compared, compared to uh, early settlement days, there's a lot more people there now than there were then, but it is still one of the most uh, sparsely populated counties in Missouri. Yes. Um, and so I, I think that that definitely gives me that that sense. Um, and we talked we talked earlier about this. Another one that just makes me uh, think about that is so many of the stories coming out of the Civil War um, are evocative of of Germanic tales because uh, there was such deprivation and starvation going on. Most people who mm -hmm. left it because they were starving. Um, a number of uh, stories of women and children uh, living in the woods because their home's been burned and there's no crops, there's no garden, uh, you know, surviving on berries and roots and whatever they might be able to catch or kill. Um, and also, couple of very harsh winters during the wartime uh, <clears throat> as well. And so, I mean, it's very evocative of, you know, those tales of coming out of the Great Famine. It is. And it, it highlights the fact, of course, that, you know, something with the Great Famine and the plague years were so long ago, and of course, on a different continent, it is easy to feel as though that is somehow vastly removed from the human experience. Mm -hmm. um, the, the devastation, the essentially destruction of so much of the, the life infrastructure that really had very rapidly developed in uh, between 1821, uh, the founding of the state of Missouri, and, uh, and, uh, and 1861, really some very, you know, comparatively short amount of time, uh, there, there had been a lot of settlement, a lot of infrastructure development, a lot of um, really sense of statehood that had developed in uh, really just a handful of decades. And in the, certainly in the, the Burnt District, but really throughout much of the Ozarks and other locations of Missouri, the war devastated that infrastructure and left uh, families destitute, left women and children and the elderly starving during the winters. It was a, uh, it, and this wasn't that long ago. No, it wasn't. We're talking 160 years and uh, which to some seem an eternity, but it really isn't. Um, no. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to throw one at you that you threw at me earlier. Um, yes. Um, where do you draw the line with some of the urban legends and, and these and the motifs that go really go back to the war? <laughs> oh <laughs> my God, that is that is a good question, and I think it, it's a little bit difficult to to answer with with a, with a, with a direct answer because there is conflation uh, between you know your your traditional uh don't go into the forest there's uh there's a you know a boogeyman with a with a machete mm -hmm. and then crossing over to much more ancient motifs and traditions that that you do see something that uh that i like about the the really traditional fairy tales is that they are in essence encoded in mm -hmm. in very unique ways one that is really interesting to me is the fairy tale of Iron John. You can read it initially and be like, okay, so it's a thing, it happened. But 
there's a there's an interesting element because you're essentially being introduced to uh, the green man uh yeah. and the the idea that that the green man represents a primeval part of man that if left unattended uh, or feared is very dangerous but if respected and befriended uh, can begin to help act as guide yes and and, I, and you, you do see that well and you see it some in some part in the history of of the region but um just some of the 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 telling of the of the tales of of uh particularly travelers in the ozarks early travelers of uh, being forewarned about this and that and being forewarned uh uh even about you know rawhead and so forth um mm -hmm. uh, serve the same purpose as those tales it does and and that brings up a really interesting bit of lore rawhead and bloody bones interestingly enough i think for a variety of reasons there's uh, um, uh a low country raw head and bloody bones and then there's a germanic raw head and bloody bones mm -hmm. and they they share the same name they're both um folkloric or um phantom creatures they're both associated with witchcraft but and you would think that would be enough to tie them together but beyond that they are vastly different yeah. and there's you know the, there's there's a lot of different moving parts on that but the 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 concept of the the witch who um through um uh, through through magic has has essentially reassembled or reanimated uh, a hog, mm -hmm. and it does her bidding. Yeah. In, in essence, if you want to strip it down to its barest parts, that element seems to be different than the uh, the raw head and bloody bones of Low Country, which shares the same name, but seems to be more associated with uh, with Loa. Yeah. And. You know, I th I think that there's just so many there's so many tales of of mountain witchcraft and so forth in the Ozarks mm -hmm. that yeah. um, it's not surprising that those tales ended up becoming fairly prominent here as well. I think so. And the, there's a couple of different elements with that, I, I think, which brings me to an idea that I, I want to cross reference. But a great deal of Appalachian and Ozarkian mountain witchcraft is associated with Germany, uh, with German settlers, and with, uh, with German witchcraft. And we're talking uh, essentially what the English called cunning, the cunning folk. Mm -hmm. uh to such a large degree so that is is interesting it's also something that would be largely more known of as granny women mm -hmm. and <clears throat> like like any of this traditional craft uh the the concept of good or bad is in the eye of the recipient <laughs> <That's> true <laughs> uh and and i think that's an incredibly important distinction uh when it comes to witchcraft we we think of is witchcraft good is witchcraft bad witchcraft is always bad witchcraft could be good then there's white witchcraft so on and so forth not really it's a skill set it's a tool set uh is your hammer and chisel and nails good or bad it's the question of what are you doing with it and that uh that i think this is one of the best analogies to parse things out and, and help people understand uh what i what i would consider to be a more a more traditionalist way of looking at this and along with that is if uh you know party a 
has something bad done to them by party B. So party A seeks out a witch to respond. Mm -hmm. And then the, the said witchcraft in response does something bad to party B. Uh, obviously party B then responds and says, yikes, witchcraft is black. It's black magic. It's awful. It shouldn't have happened. Um, but you have to contextualize that in the question of what did party B do in the first place? Yeah. In the first place. And it, I, I really think that even today, uh, the concept of witchcraft holds a, a uniquely misplaced understanding in American culture and, and Western culture at large. I, I agree. I, I agree. Um, put so many absolutes on it that um, in popular culture that don't make a lot of sense in practice. Yes. Uh, we touched on this also earlier a little bit, but what, 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 what's your thought of the prevalence of the motif of the acts in, in lore in, in Ozark's lore as well? Oh my gosh, not to, not to mention that one house in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that did have Ozark connections to Alaska, yes. Um, that's a really good question. I, I think that the, the, the motif of the act today is mostly lost on, on the public. Uh, mm -hmm. obviously we understand yikes it's sharp and theoretically it's red and you know if you're in in specific uh locations you might use an axe but an axe is not part of daily life right and that did not used to be the case no and in and, 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 and it's particularly an association with the forest and you know the huntsmen and and <clears throat> and surviving in the forest and there are a lot of those kind of tales in the ozarks as well i i would i would further postulate that the the motif of the axe from these earlier stories and earlier meaning realistically from post iron age to about 1945 right right uh the about 3,500 years there. Yeah, that there is um, a, 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 a uniquely visceral point that is being made with the motif of the ax, uh, as opposed to a halberd or a sword or a knife. Uh, because the ax expressly was not a weapon of war. Right. Uh, the axe was a, wasn't even a weapon. The axe was a tool that children would be using to cut firewood in the front yard. The, this it is a tool that um, that families would see immediate family members packing and using. And, and I think that what is what is unique about this is that it is telling tales of danger that is immediate mm -hmm. and is the 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 worst kind of uh of visceral horror uh for the same reason that zombie movies are popular now the the idea of the zombie that is the family member right the, the something that's very familiar and, and ordinary that and and the idea that that the person who should be representing safety and the tool that should be representing hearth is being used to kill and has suddenly turned or gone bad or become enchanted or bewitched in a really horrific way. And, and, I, and, and I think the vestiges of that we see in urban legends mm -hmm. today. Yes. You know, and and I think- A plethora of those. <laughs> The uh, and and we we do see some interesting um, revisits of the motif under certain circumstances. Uh, I'm going to reference supernatural as a as a whole, but the idea of individuals coming to their demise through supernatural means 
but in really bloody ways, typically with normal household objects. Uh, the, the, the table saw, the garage door, the, uh, the, the blender, the, the garbage disposal, the, the, car, the car in the garage, yeah. these types of things, because these are things that we interact with and we don't associate negatively. That's part right. of our home. I, I, I agree. And then, you know, it, it got mixed up with sort of, and we've talked about this before, but really Scooby-Doo. Yes. You know, and so I, I, I think those combination of factors led to so many of these ur urban legends that, and they're everywhere, but they are here too, that we have a number of them that you have a hatchet man, you have a, someone with an ax and there's something usually, something a little odd about them. They're an albino or this or that, um, that um, I think preys on that same motif that goes back to those German tales. It's that very ordinary person, ordinary tool, but with a slight twist, it's now your worst nightmare. <clears throat> and I, I think that, that realistically that carries more visceral horror and thus uh, is remembered. And, and in theory, the lessons that are contained therein are also remembered in ways that are deeper than, uh, you know, an unknown army, mm -hmm. which ironically was not a particularly uncommon experience in continental Europe during the, the for centuries. <clears throat> so you know those those elements i think again i think it is the the horror of the of the familiar turning against us and you know maybe another thing that um we 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 discussed it before we went live here too um that that fear the the forest and sort of of uh, meeting in the forest and everything you can really apply this with the ball numbers as well that is very true <clears throat> the the and especially when you start getting into the the lore the 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 idea of the ball numbers as opposed to say historical record of the ball numbers right right and i yeah and i'm yeah i'm talking more of the motif the the images that have come down the mask and so forth and you made a very good point on on that i don't know if you want to elaborate the the and of course it's from a historical standpoint it's very important to understand first of all um the bald knobbers were southwest missouri vigilantes uh who <clears throat> mostly uh originated in, in attempt to bring law and order back to uh, a, a broken infrastructure following the, the Civil War. And it is also interesting that there's a great deal of misconception that, uh, or conflation uh, of bald knobbers with the Klan. Yeah, yeah. And more from an outside perspective or an uneducated perspective, it is crucially important to understand that they were not the Klan no. uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination. And the original bald knobbers who were founded, uh, who founded in uh, in Taney County were largely um, union mm -hmm. and union leaning and were were individuals who had in in some cases come into uh, Taney County Missouri following the war uh, from uh, not only you know union, sympathizing backgrounds but literally from the union yeah and and we're we're attempting to put together uh you know to to create law and order how well they succeeded in that is up to debate but it is it is crucially important to understand that uh that the, that the bald numbers were were not racially motivated they were and they were not the remotely associated with the clan that is, and, and I find this interesting, even back in 2017, 
uh, coming back to State of the Ozarks Fest, uh, there's times that me and several other guys will put on bald knobber masks and walk around. When I first proposed that, I had people say, no, you can't do that. Yeah. And I went, yeah, I can. And if somebody has an issue with it, this is a really good time to educate them about our history uh, and, and how it works. I'm not going to shy away from potential misunderstanding when it is also an educational opportunity. So if you come to State of the Ozarks Fest, you may be see, see me walking around with a bald number mask on. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're black and they appear to have cloth horns. Mm -hmm. And the interesting enough also from a historical, historical accuracy point, the Taney County bald numbers did not wear masks like this, but the later shortly later uh christian county bald knobbers did and that's a whole another story but the the bald knobber masks um you know black masks with horns like devils it as a motif while while it may not have been you know fully fleshed out i i doubt that in the 1870s and 1880s somebody down here was was uh, you know waxing long about the anthropological meaning of the horned god of Central Europe, but the horned god of Central Europe, uh, which which certainly draws some Celtic motif as well, some Celtic ties as well with Kernunos, shaped continental Europe's view of the devil. Yes. And, uh, and it, you know, we simply don't know, but in designing the mass, it, they very well could have uh, been influenced by various older tales. And I think, I think realistically they, they did. I think it is, um, I think that it is unrealistic, especially when you, and take into consideration we're, we're dealing with highly rural populations even the the union leaning folks coming in were still largely rural mm -hmm. uh the, the the and and it, and you know on top of that we're dealing with people who were were wanting to make a point uh to uh to the population they were wanting to to create something that would resonate uh on a, on a visceral level and this is essentially before mass media as we simply understand it today. Right. Not well, saying that there was... There's a long history of wearing masks to, 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 to hide who you are and I mean, even in, in Lord. The Wolf and Lord at Riding Hood is a good example of that. Yes. Yes, it is. And <clears throat> you, you look at the ritual mask wearing, especially when it is associated with mob action. And that was, you know, two, two things that, that really became an issue uh, <laughs> that, that, and, and I'm, the, there's a lot that I like about the Bull Creek Dave family. Oh, I'll say that right off. So we're dealing with uh, Chadwick and uh, and Sparta, and uh, there's there's a really heartbreaking conclusion to this story that we won't get into here, uh, but that did conclude in May of 1889, um, and brought the concept of the bald number to national attention with a botched hanging on the Ozark Square. That said. Uh, that there is something very powerful. There is something very um, ritual. There is something that that strikes very deep into shamanic lore uh, of the 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 wearing of masks, the the forsaking of one's identity through ritual. Mm -hmm. and the 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 action of uh of the moment the action of the mob that uh it, it emboldens individuals you 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 know as I, I think from a uh from a from a shamanistic perspective it uh it encourages individuals 
to act uh, as their as their mask dictates, act as their their ritual dictates, rather than certainly than how they would if they were alone uh, and not participating. Exactly, and you know the mask could have been made in a lot of ways, but it is it is reminiscent of the horn god. It is, and uh, and and. The, there's whether you call the horn god the horn god or whether you call it the christian devil or wh whatever you want to call it the 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 idea is the same you are really embodying choosing to embody or channel um vengeance um instill fear uh instill a a response and uh and they did i think that's an important fact that the the individuals i usually when we talk about the bald numbers i i'm i'm typically talking about them from a from a very sympathetic perspective because mm -hmm. uh, i realized it was a long time ago but i've been to their graves i like these guys uh i i think they're cool there's there's a lot going for them that said they were acting out in in vigilante mob action mob violence they were doing so under the cover of anonymity to such a large degree and they were placing themselves above the law and saying it's okay if we hurt these people it's okay if we kill these people because our society is going to be better because of it right the the, the perceived end justifying the means yes and uh that that didn't turn out so well and no, i think it, it didn't and <laughs> and i think some I, I think i think some of the people who were involved started out with very with more noble intentions and it, it uh that mob mentality ended up affecting their intentions in the end so and and I think that there's there's a there's a cautionary tale mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, that we can take to heart today it is something that I really think is interesting. You you referenced Little Red Riding Hood, and there there is an interesting undercurrent of mistaken or hidden identity that runs through that story. There's there's some really disturbing elements of it once you've separated out uh the the childhood tale oh definitely <laughs> definitely uh, and and of course separated it from uh, uh a couple of fantastic looney tune skits and <laughs> and it is there's 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 a horrifying element and and i think that obviously there are others too there are other grimm's fairy tales as well but the 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 you know red riding hood and the wolf really brings the point of um horrific violence coming in the form of someone you think you know mm -hmm. to the forefront in a way that most of the other stories do not with a few exceptions <laughs> yeah <laughs> true <laughs> Uh. it's uh you know very in that uh vein uh i think one potential last last point on dark tales and in, in you know germanic history of course germanic history is pretty dark in and of itself um i can't really argue that it isn't in my opinion but something just to really hit home the the sense of wilderness is the the reality that herman herman missouri mm -hmm. uh was was officially founded in december of 1837 mm -hmm. and it was done so by 17 settlers who stepped off of a steamboat from st louis presumably into <laughs> quote unquote a howling wilderness in which there simply was no infrastructure whatsoever and in 10 short years they had managed to build a thriving community that was a major steamboat port and 
uh, a, a, an incredible town mm -hmm. and, and really beat back the, the howling wilderness and, and bring this, this sense of order and civilization to the Missouri River that today, if you go, you cannot argue uh, against its beauty. No. And, and, and it's really, it's very exquisite. But there are still in that region, and this is we're talking central Missouri between Jeff City and uh, and, and St. Louis. Lots of infrastructure, lots of lots of roads, uh, lots of small towns and some decent-sized towns, lots of civilization. But there are still spots that you could lose yourself very, very quickly. Exactly, and. I mean, and it, it does have a lot of parallels with a lot of the Germanic uh, fairy tales, um, just building that area. Yes. And it, uh, it's, it, to me, um, I've gotten to spend a, a week up there, actually in 2020, and it is, I, I love it. It's one of my favorite spots in Missouri, but there is a, to me, uh, there there is an undercurrent of uh, of haunting, uh, particularly at dusk, uh, particularly in autumn, that is unmistakable. And I, you know, I think some of it is just innate to the land, but I can't help but think that some of it comes with the the people, the old world as well. I th I, I think that's fair in, in in my experience there as well. I do. I do. Oh, uh, that said, haunted mines. Haunted mines. Well, um, you know, as you said, I think in the beginning, we often think of these spaces, these kinds of spaces, and those are we think of caves. Um, but there's so many um, mines, and again, there's a little bit, you know, parallel with with Germany. Um, so much of it is karst limestone and some and mining areas as well. Um, so similar experiences in the old world is here in a lot of ways. And a lot of the, um, you had a lot of immigrants coming in um, that were mining the areas. And, and there were several main areas. Um, I think first, if you look at the Eastern Ozarks, you have, you have to think about the, the old French mines. Um, we're talking generally the St. Genevieve area and up into Washington County, places like Old Mines, literally, um, French Village, Cadet, um, uh, Val Mine. Um, <laughs> and these places go back a lot farther than most places that were sold in, in the Ozarks. Um, they were settled in the, you know, 1720s uh, yep. by, by French, um, French Creoles coming down from Canada and mm -hmm. some stopped here before they got to Louisiana, basically. We don't think about Creole culture mm -hmm. being here, but, but they were and still are. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I read an article this afternoon about there are still people in the old French mine area that speak French, mm. you know? So uh, it's still part of all that. Uh, so it's very ancient um, in comparison. Um, and there are hauntings associated. There's, there's a, um, a haunted uh, railroad tunnel in uh, Val mine area that, and I find there, I heard tales in various parts of the country related to railroad tunnels being haunted. And again, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's the tunnel, it's a cave life, uh, it's reminiscent of, you know, old world tales of, you know, creatures that live in these hidden places in the mountains and so forth. Yes. Um, and I have not, although, it's a well-known haunted story. I have not, I've not been able to find information that says, you know, there was a train wreck there or this happened or that to account for it. But um, 
very well-known story. Also in that area, uh, it's now, um, they call it the Lost History Museum, but it, uh, in Vail as well, that the house there dates to 1749 and was built by Francois Vail. Uh, it also was the site of a shootout uh, between um, Union and Confederate troops during the Civil War. Um, and uh, it is known to be haunted and employees uh, and visitors say that uh, the most common thing that happens is that people will have their hair pulled. Mm. <laughs> Which is not an uncommon occurrence in a number of paranormal sites. No, no. My experience is often that usually is associated with a child spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. But, uh, again, um, have not found a lot of information that would say, oh, this child died or that, that kind of thing or anything. But um, I just thought it's, that's very interesting that, that that's the persistent claim is that having your hair pulled while you're in the museum it is it's very interesting coming back to the uh the train tunnel something that often gets missed is that railroad construction particularly in the 19th century was exceptionally dangerous with a high casualty count yes uh, especially when they were uh, blasting and trying to to build tunnels through the mountains and, and from, the, from the photo I've seen, from photos I've seen of it, I'm not sure that they blasted it. It almost looks like it was dug out and then. Mm. Um, Which is. A very early tunnel. There's, and I haven't done, I haven't actually done a documentation on this, uh, but one individual that I talked to, if he's listening, he'll know who I'm talking, he'll, he'll know I'm talking about him. Uh, did a, a preliminary paranormal investigation in a train tunnel in Colorado with uh -huh. um, some exceptionally negative responses. I, I know there's there's one I want to say it's in Maryland. I want to say it's in Maryland that is very similar that it's uh, very, very um, negative EVPs, et cetera, not and not negative in the sense of, you know, like it's inhuman, that kind of thing, but just very angry, stay away, get get out of here kind of things. Yes. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> when, when you take into consideration that we may be dealing with, with multiple human spirits who died under the extreme circumstances. Yes. That that's... Well, and, and one thing, too, is that um i i think an issue that kind of plays in in this area is as other groups came in later after after the french creole came in um they they were kind of pushed into several small areas mining areas and i think assimilation was a little more uneasy there mm -hmm. <laughs> um that the the french were not accepted by new newer settlers very well right <clears throat> well and something that may or may not i'm purely conjecturing at this point um may or may not have contributed to that was that uh french trading settlements did historically have a really positive relationship with first nation Native Americans, mm -hmm. uh, and and also in many cases intermarrying. Yes, and and I and I get the sense that 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 my understanding is that area that that did happen, and then mm -hmm. um, then later the you know uh, Anglo Saxon settlers came through, <laughs> and uh, in conflict potentially ensued. Which is part of the story. It's now I, I'm very interested. I find this very 
in, in, we're going to you know tie back to some German lore, but not just German lore, European lore as as a whole. Uh, the the haunted mine, the haunted tunnel. The term haunt or haunting, uh, I, I think, it is a bit too generic in this particular case. When uh, you you bring into the into into play the the cultural traditions of, for example, kobolds, tommyknockers, uh, dwarves. And I hesitate to use the term dwarf because we have, uh, of course, little people, but that's not the reason. But because popular culture, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, gave, you know, create, created this, this uh, um, motif in our minds, I think that Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings helped us reclaim the, the original idea of the dwarven peoples. Uh, and I, I don't know if this particular story is actually true or not. I did read it. I haven't cited the source. I you know, haven't dug into the source material. Uh, but there is a great anecdote of uh, Tolkien uh, submitting uh, the Leaf Fellowship of the Ring to the editors and having a, a note come back telling him that, that there's, there's, there's no such word uh, as as dwarven, it is dwarfish, and having him reply, you should check again because I wrote the dictionary, and yes, it is. That is that is true because and he and and he had written the um, the in, he had written the relevant entries for the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> yes, that 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 is a, that is a true story. <laughs> the, uh, the the ultimate the ultimate literary own. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, yes. Uh, <laughs> it, yes. Can't change my work because I said so, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and I truly know better than you do. I um, <clears throat> I love it. With with that, uh, I, I I like the term Tommy knockers and you know Stephen King aside, and the the term kobolds. Um, mm -hmm because they are they they don't have as much uh pop culture baggage associated but it is a, a really unique idea of a a spirit that isn't a spirit a a creature that isn't a creature a a sentient human like apparition that isn't human it is many things and it is nothing exactly what we want to categorize but it seems to haunt or as a race that isn't a race or a species that isn't a species seems to reside in the mountains in the dark places um, functions almost as a primordial or elemental yeah uh, um, manifestation Mm -hmm. that appears to show a great deal of sentience at, at the same time appearances of the kobolds appearances of the the um almost pixies um the tommy knockers etc it is very similar to the irish fairy lore about the little people the idea of dark skinned elderly little men mm -hmm. who uh, appear to be working. They appear to be hard at work, dressed in, in clothing that is not dissimilar to, uh, to humans, but typically of an earlier time. Right, like a remnant from the past. Yes, uh, an echo, but not, uh, not a not an echo it's the the thing that is devilishly hard to to pin down on on this lore is that it's like a lot of things but then it isn't any of them well and and one and i i was well we were talking it yeah it kept going through my mind it reminds me so much of the quapa um tales of the iwa 
um, yeah. which are from the, 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 the Quapaw lived in Arkansas and then now uh, in Northwest or Northeast Oklahoma. And um, the Iwa are creatures that kind of defy description in, in classification because they're, they, they're not human but in their spirit, but they are physical as well. Yes. Um, and the way that they are described would make them, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they're, that they're hideous creatures, they're de demonic like or uh, this kind of thing, that they're in human shape, but not really human. Um, and they can be a bit of tricksters and they do kind of exist in the forest or uh, in, in the secluded areas you know yes uh, and beware if they come around um so it's it's very much the same thing same kind of thing agreed and <clears throat> something that you know coming back to to cherokee uh lore uh about the cherokee little people uh, very similar descriptions in terms of dress etc but what is interesting is that the whatever it is that's appearing appears to be dressing appropriate to each culture yeah that, true true so i mean and I, I i guess in that sense you could say maybe maybe it's the same creature whether it's in germany or northeast oklahoma or wherever <laughs> yes and in in many cases the the more uh, pre-industrial people's conclusion had a lot of similarities including an association with ancestor spirits yes now now the quapa will say they are not ancestor spirits they are separate Interesting. Um, yeah they they say you know you have ancestor spirits and they are just spirit they're just they're your human ghosts but that the iwa are something different and that you you know depending on what the evil wants to do, you could you know, pass your hand through it or it would seem as solid as another person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, there's a, the, mm, it, so Welsh Tommy knockers, I'm gonna land on Welsh Tommy knockers for a moment. Okay. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a great story of course, the, the association with the Tommy Knockers, and this has very little association with the Stephen King book and film, uh, but that they are kobolds or pixies who mine, mm -hmm. um, in, in, traditionally in the copper mines. And I think that it is of particular note that the Welsh copper mines were in business, and I use the term business quite literally, mm -hmm. um, into the Neolithic period. Yes, yeah, it does go back thousands of years. Uh, I, I find it. I find it particularly fascinating that uh, I find it particularly fascinating. We don't, you know, you, you talk about the Neolithic era, mm -hmm. and there, there is something I think ingrained in our arrogant post twentieth century, post modern. Uh, decadent minds, particularly if we, you know, had the good fortune or misfortune, depending on one's perspective, of going to the um, the big museums in Chicago and seeing the life-size dioramas, complete yeah. with saber-toothed cats uh, and uh, and primitive man, and then mentions of the Neolithic, along with the Paleolithic. I just like saying lithic. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> that, okay, professor. <laughs> that that we associate, and, and we somehow think, oh, these people were vastly different from us. They were nearly primate, or they were they were this, they were that. We certainly don't associate them with uh, industry, trade, trying to make a living, uh, shipping tin and copper thousands of miles by ship 
literally. Yeah, and you mentioned the paperwork. Yes. <laughs> oh, I know, and it's before paper. Uh, and yet, uh, the 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 uh, the the copper mines of Cornwall and Wales were doing a thriving industry mm -hmm. in the Neolithic period uh, mm -hmm. throughout Europe. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> helping helping create weapons of war to uh, you know foster the Bronze Age, so it's uh, it's it to me it's it's actually quite reassuring that no matter where we go, there we are. Human yeah. beings are have it changed, and that right. is both terrifying and comforting simultaneously. But what it also says is that the the mines of Wales and Cornwall have an ancient tradition and of course ancient lore associated with that so there's a there's a story from comparatively recent uh you know 1800s of the miners in the the welsh mines near the atlantic coast and they begin to hear the tommy knockers they hear the sounds of miners they mm -hmm. hear the murmur of voices, they hear the sounds of mining mm -hmm. in the deep dark. <laughs> and they, it, it gets so notable that the, the peasant folk, country folk, miners stop going into the mines, even mm -hmm. to, you know, draw a pittance of a paycheck and the the guys in charge the management so to speak who of course you know are too educated to believe in these sorts of things have to start investigating because the guys won't go down in the in the mines anymore and that two things one uh that shortly after this according to the story there was a major cave-in that would have killed countless people had they continued but the other is that when they were questioned about where the sounds of the Tommy doctors were coming from, they were coming from out to the west within the mines, which was physically impossible because it was under the seabed. Right. But thousands of years ago, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know they have found remains of villages on the seabed, so yes, the so. ocean moved, which sounds crazy, but it happened. And to me, there's just something well, chilling. Well, it, it, it's related to the the last ice age because yes. you had more, you had more water tied up in um, ice glaciers, ice around the world. And so the sea levels were much lower. So you had, you, um, you had villages and in, in cities and areas that are now underwater. And so, you know, maybe they were carrying miners. Yes. <laughs> Which... and, and, and maybe it was literally a, a warning that the cave in was coming. Yes. Which to me, I love that story. It's one of my favorite Celtic stories and it, it's particularly fun for me because it's from wales um, yeah. i i yeah i i do i love that story i really do you know that might be a good segue into the crystal mines yes i like um, that and um and people don't think about it but there are a number of mines in arkansas that literally mine crystal Yes. And, and I think because we tend to think of mining as involving quote commodities, you know, and but it's a, a thriving business and it's gone on. Um, and then um, particularly the one in particular that has the tail, but it, I, th I think there are others from stories I've heard of um, unusual events going on. But particularly, uh, Board Camp um, Crystal Mine near me yes. um, is 
has lots of reports of very strange activity, which kind of made, makes me think of the Tommyknockers to a degree in, in a way. Um, you have lots of stories of unusual noises, um, but also thrown rocks. Uh, yes. Even supposedly levitating rocks. Yes. Um, now, you know, I don't have any firsthand information or anything, but it's it's been reported by a number of people. Um, I know there's some videos out there that I've looked at and I didn't see levitation, but, you know, I, I, I'm not saying it, it didn't happen, but I just I haven't seen that it did. But, um, but, you know, whether you want to say it's a haunting or, or just something unusual in, in the atmosphere, there does seem to be something going on. Yes. As far as I know, there are not too many tales of like, you know, there's there's no signs of an apparition or you know, disembodied voices that kind of thing but just very strange things that happen yes and <clears> there's <throat> the, the, some unique conclusions or conjectures mm -hmm. that that are drawn uh, the the two the two primary uh the that are are currently associated uh are one bigfoot uh that the the area is is renowned for uh encrypted sightings or encrypted yes. activity and the second is ufos that that's true that it's it's gotten that that uh, correlation um yeah. and you know i guess also so, um sometimes that you know odd lights are seen that kind of thing of course the, i mean lights can be seen over other you know mines and so forth sometimes too and i think it's it can be ge uh, geological um and i guess one note is a lot of these other mines that are either particularly lead and zinc in eastern missouri and southwestern missouri um there's a lot of crystal there yes. as well because there tend to be found uh crystal tends to be found where there is lead and zinc although in arkansas you don't have the lead and zinc you mainly have crystal and then in some places actually diamonds yes information volcano but um so definitely seems to be something supernatural in some in you know at least in appearance you know um, something something very odd you know, uh, now, and inexplicable in terms of phenomena right now now if i if i just put my paranormal investigation hat on yes I, I would say that you know there's definitely a possibility that some of these odd things are related to uh elevated uh conductivity of electricity with high crystal structure um, yes. uh, many people don't realize that uh, actually quartz is the best conductor of electricity that we know of um, mm -hmm. and in fact in uh, communication satellites and like satellites that carry tv signals etc uh, they don't use electronics they you know, uh, they use crystal because it, they don't burn out because it's kind right. of hard to fix it once it's up there so um so if you if you have if you have a lot of energy going through there maybe it's creating you know lights or or these these rods that appear to move, you know. Uh, yes. Sort of, can't say anything about levitation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Although, I mean, they have proven in the last few years that they, they can actually levitate um, objects with even with sound. So, um, right. Under certain circumstances. So, who knows? Right. It is. It is interesting. I do think that 
now, you know, for, for a long time now, uh, crystals have a, a great deal of uh, magical cachet in, in, uh, in a number of circles, circles yeah. that we, we oftentimes, you know, roam near. <laughs> <clears throat> Please don't roll around in. And, and I, I will, I will, you know, absolutely put myself out there and saying that I, I love quartzite. I love our, I have a collection of Arkansas diamonds. Uh, I mean, I do too. I mean, I, I do too. And, and I think amethyst is absolutely beautiful. And it, it, these, mm, these elements of the earth are just really, they are captivating. Mm-hmm. They are beautiful. Uh, they, it, for me personally, I, I'd love for these things to do something, whether they do or not, just because they look so cool. That's true. And, and you know, I, I will say, I, I think there's, you know, I think there's possibilities of, again, energy or electricity affecting them, et cetera. Um, <coughs> And you're familiar with particular situation of some of mine. Um, yes. That, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, we can explain that, but um, right, it happens. But um, as far as, but again, you know, I, I can even see stones maybe moving or appearing to move. Uh, through energy the levitation I don't know about I mean I guess if it's strong enough fields but you I just haven't seen anything quantified yet right and I, I honestly I, I hope think, they do I mean that'd be great it'd be cool it really would I uh I, I I'm, I'm willing to go out on whim and then manage to make everybody angry at the same time by <laughs> by yeah I'm trying saying, to be nice <laughs> I know uh, I, I do think that I do think the crystals have uh, a resonance that is real but undetectable with current 20th century or immediate post 20th century tech to a large degree. I think that's fair. Um, and, and I do think that some people are more sensitive to that than others. Uh, I recognize that in a number of traditions, it has a very long uh and uh, an honorable history yes that is that is well worth respecting um i would also caution individuals from jumping headlong into crystal mania simply based on a handful of quick google searches i think that's very fair or very generic um mass marketed books Yes. And I think so, you know, again, I think that my, my conclusion is, uh, you know, there, there aren't easy answers with crystals, but there is something there. Yeah. So, you know, I guess that's a a story to perhaps in the future will there be more answers, but certainly (laughs) something odd does seem to appear uh, happening at that mine. So. I yes, and I'm. I'd like to to make it down there. I really would. I, you know, in terms of uh, superstition or fun crystals, I I I like to think of myself as a you know child of the the latter twentieth century that is very objective, and I'm an objective journalist. At the same time, won't lie have walked around with crystals and buckeyes in my pocket on a semi to quite regular basis. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, and sometimes it's difficult uh, to reconcile all of it. Sometimes you just have to recognize that there isn't a reconciliation. You just do what you do. Exactly. Uh, I, I would caution people 
uh, respect the tradition, but don't put all your crystals in one basket. Exactly. You know, and sometimes it, you know, it may just be a lucky, lucky rock or. And, yeah. I now okay so put your own energy into it. <laughs> and and that is something else. Um we oftentimes don't take ourselves into consideration as part of the natural environment. Very true. Very true. And I do think that happen that that is part of what happens with some of these objects a lot of times. The, now, I the, don't know about at this mine, but right. The energy that we bring with us has a great deal of impact on the energy around us. And very true. Very true. If, I mean, if, and we all you, know that we don't want to recognize it, but we all know it because you can walk, sometimes you walk into a room and you, you can feel the energy and it sometimes you can just tell who 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 is putting out that vibe that seems to be affecting the whole room. Yes, both positively or negatively. Yeah. It, it can know, go either way and it, uh really can. if you and if anybody wants a pop culture reference to illustrate this that also has deep and abiding ties to Carl Jung and uh and deep archetypes just watch the Empire Strikes Back and uh the point when Luke goes into the tree cave on Dagobah uh and takes his weapons with him despite Yoda telling him not to yeah and the uh the force manifests itself as a cautionary tale that is also his worst nightmare exactly <laughs> i really jumping over into to hauntings and poltergeist activity for just a moment i actually just it just crossed my mind so i don't want to forget it that's actually not a bad illustration for what can happen that's true. You know, I had never thought about it, but that's true. I, I hadn't thought about it until right now. Of course, for people who you know know me reasonably well, they know I grew up with Star Wars, so I memorized the original trilogy. Um, but the idea that the the Force Cave, um, the Force Tree Cave on Dagobah, is just really strong in energy, mm -hmm. and that whatever the Jedi in training takes with him into the cave is what it manifests. Yep. And presumably with the story that if Luke had had the good sense to not take his weapon, he actually actually would have learned that Darth Vader was his father, but in a very positive way. Or at least potentially. Mm -hmm. But he took his, you know, he found it out in a really negative way. So the idea is that the tree is giving back to you whatever you take to it. Well, and, you know, the whole saying what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is that I, I do think this is powerful i think there's a lot of you know study of this not just uh on a on an academic level but on a on the ground in the field level with people with energies with locations there's a lot of life lessons that we stand to gain if we are if we're willing to face that I agree. I'm gonna I'm gonna move over to a more a, a traditional haunting. Yes. To a mine, and this is actually in the extreme west um, Ozarks uh, over on the Kansas side, um, because you did have you had lead mines um, in the Galena, Kansas area, but just a few miles north, closer to Pittsburgh, you had coal mines. And yes. um, and a lot of a lot of coal mining in the area was strip mining, but early on, it was a regular um, dug mine. Um, and um, actually, we investigated um, property that had an old mine on it um, several times, and it actually tunneled into the hill. And it had been in the same family for well over a hundred years. And they had mined it with, you know, wagons and mules and 
the entrance to the mine was closed off at the it's closed off at this point but people will see apparitions of miners see mm. apparitions of the mules pulling wagons um so they've seen them you know as if it's going if going into the mine entrance even though it's barricaded now um coming out of etc there were there were miners who died in the mine uh in accidents a handful over the years um but um that those things have been seen by the family for for decades uh at different times and so very, very traditional apparition related to the mines um yeah. I find it interesting that they that the mules they see the mules and the wagons as well, not just the miners. Absolutely. In, in that particular case, would you lean more toward um, a, a ripple in time, or or a sentient apparition? Um, it does not. Uh, there, there really nothing that I know of appears to really be sentient because it seems to be the miners as well as the animals and the wagons don't seem to interact or be aware of you um okay. so it, it could just be you know a ripple in time that you're seeing something um now there there could have been there could have been mules that died in the mine too I'm, this is true know. um this. that may be affecting it i don't know mm -hmm. but that that's that's one personal experience that I, that's vividly the mine itself is haunted yes uh, but um then as you get in get into the lead mining area yeah you know from say you know uh, ornogo and web city through joplin down into the picture oklahoma down to granby and so forth um there are a number of mining related uh hauntings um and some I think particularly in Galena and Joplin, it's hard to know, is it the mine itself where that's being haunted or not? Because so many are closed off and been and filled in that yeah. there, there are hauntings from that time period that people drive over what was a mine all the time and don't know it often. Yes, yes. Um, but, you know, there are some that I, that, uh, I do know directly do have ties to mining that are kind of interesting one um is is now an apartment building it has four apartments in it in joplin that originally was an ice house mm. and what what would happen would um and of course this is before refrigeration etc they keep ice uh in there keep it cold and when people when men were killed in the mines they were brought to the ice house until hopefully someone claimed the body yes and uh, investigated it several times and lots lots of activity lots of disembodied voices shadows um and um pointing to often being very restless yes uh, not necessarily you know angry or striking out but just very disconnected and confused or disoriented and uh, even some evps indicating you know why am i here you know mm -hmm. um, which in a way would make sense because they wouldn't necessarily have a direct connection to the ice house. Right. It's also a bit heartbreaking. It is. It is. And and there would be times that, you know, people that, you know, particularly when there were tens of thousands of transient miners in the area, that the body may not be claimed. And so it would stay for a period of time and then get a pauper's grave. Yes. This uh, really quickly brings up a, a question. Obviously, there are 
graveside or cemetery hauntings. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> areas, you know, <clears throat> less, less so at the grave than at other locations. And it seems that locations where a body was stored temporarily um, or locations where someone died, particularly hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, that, that it, it seems that if there, there's sort of a misplaced or disassociated spirit, that they they're, they're confused or upset about the fact that they're dead right it, it seems to be associated with those locations not necessarily not always the location of death but oftentimes the location of the body shortly after death that's true i mean that is true and i actually have another example uh, here uh written down that i was going to talk about and yes that is the old prosperity school um in prosperity uh which mm -hmm. is maybe two miles from my house um which was a mining community and the the school was built in 1907 and was a a four room no yeah i guess five room schoolhouse and um for the miners' children. And uh, later on, it was turned into a home, later on into a bed and breakfast, and now it is, again, a private home. I've investigated a number of times. Um, actually, it's been featured on TV shows, in fact. Um, and uh, I've seen shadow men in there, uh, et cetera. But one recurring um, presence uh, that's there seems to be of uh, someone that was who says they were hurt in one of the mines. Mm. And, um, so uh, there's been speculation um, that at times, if there was an accident, that they would be brought to the schoolhouse until they could get a doctor etc there and so um we always kind of wondered if that was the case of someone that had died in a, a mining accident and perhaps either the body rested there or they actually passed after the accident at the schoolhouse and the idea that the the haunting could be generated or could could have manifested under either circumstance right right um and then there, there do seem to be other presences there as well, but that that is one that can't, has uh, we encountered a number of times over over time. And yes. So, I, again, it's something that happened in the mining, but I think, and and I'm not sure a good way of saying it. I think there are times that it's not necessarily that the you know the spirit is just yanked out of the body just in an instant and you know i think sometimes the separation is a little slower and perhaps you know now i'm in this spot why am i in this spot maybe especially if as you said they're confused or unsure of what happened mm -hmm. it's it's sobering i mean i think that there's a, there's a strong line of thought that wants uh, everything to be really clear cut at the point of death for yes. a wide variety of, of reasons, some of them just for personal solace, some of them for religious reasons, etc. And hauntings, particularly of this nature, really can be unsettling to people for those very reasons, because they, they'd rather upset that apple cart. Yeah. Yeah, it's it doesn't fit in the box. No, no, <laughs> it does no. not fit the box neatly, and people people don't like that. Um, no, and and understandably so. But I think it's important to to accept the objective data that comes in. Yeah, and and just take it one step at a time. 
with as much respect to those who have gone on before as possible. And some, some people, you know, from my personal experience, some people leave at, yeah. at, at point of death. It's all done. There yeah, isn't a haunting. No, I, I, I agree. Um, and, and I don't think there's any clearer answer as to why some stay and some don't. And I also have seen places that it very much appears that you have spirits that come back and forth that they cross yes. the trail at will for whatever mm. whatever purpose um, right. that i mean we really don't know and won't know till we take that journey um, right you know and that's who knows and, and i think like beal juice and we all have jobs so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not. and sandworms outside i uh, um <laughs> I, I you know i, I think that personally and that this might just be my uh you know hopefulness but i think that fostering an understanding of you know a, a respect and acceptance i think acceptance is a big yeah part of it both in this life and in the next an acceptance of the realities that we can control and acceptance of the realities we cannot control i think a lot of a lot of this tends to be associated and awareness i think acceptance and awareness of the world fostering acceptance and awareness of the world around us now facilitates the next steps um i i i agree i agree uh, and not necessarily guarantees any outcomes i'm not i'm taking my hands off that wheel but yeah. <laughs> uh, i do think that it it eases the process I, I, I think I think you are right there. I, I do think you're right. Um, yeah. And you know, um, another place that came that comes to mind, or um, actually uh, in in Galena, Kansas, which there were a number of mines there and a lot of deaths. Uh, aside from, and I actually wasn't even going to talk about the bordello. I could see the look on your face. That's I was oh, I've been thinking about the bordello since we started. <laughs> Well, one before I get there is actually. Um, uh, I realized that. <laughs> huh? I just realized I need to be careful to contextualize this statement on a regular basis. If I'm going to be saying <laughs> it, but, um, it's a historic location, guys. It's a historic location. Historical location. Yes, historic locations. And yes, we've both been there. Um, um, but an another location they are actually downtown as well a private building that um had served various purposes over the years and actually is being turned into a private residence um a lot of activity um and literally back in the day there was a mine shaft directly across the street from the building and activity would indicate that you had presences there related to the mining and so my guess was someone that had probably passed maybe in that mine or another there were so many it was hard to tell but um and then um also a presence there of a brothel girl although there did mm -hmm. not seem to be that building did not seem to have been a brothel but um not too too many blocks away was the red light district so uh, but i i just always assumed that it the the minor that seemed to be present seemed to be related to the fact that you literally were 20 feet away from a mine shaft yes and now we can talk about the bordello <laughs> Well, uh, we've done investigations. You've done a lot of work there yeah. as, uh, as doing investigations. It is, I believe, a private residence today. It is right now, yes. Um, uh, we'll see there, how long the, there was, there's a period of time it was open, a considerable period of time it was open for tours. Yes, yes, a number, a number of years. The owners have just uh, repurposed it and it, it's being used as a residence at this point. Now, they repurposed it once before, and that didn't last as well, so we'll see. 
Um, it's right on the edge of town. Mm-hmm. It's overlooking the the original mining region. Oh, very much so. And and it was built. It was built as a railroad hotel, yes. which is a was a euphemism in the day. The the railroads would build uh, sporting houses. So as the train stopped, the employees had something to do and keep them happy. And so usually you had gambling and brothel, etc. Um, and then everyone just called it a hotel. Um, and you. Um, and little detail when you know some people say oh that's not true well the the land records indicate it was um and two details in the architecture will give it away because things like the railings on the stairs are lower than standard and so on and so forth and the reason for that is it costs less to to build there's less materials now it's an unbelievably beautiful home this is our location yeah. um it's been beautifully restored yes there was it was it was in bad shape when <laughs> Very restoration <bad> shape. began <laughs> i i wasn't there i saw pictures oh my gosh it's... <laughs> believe me i i I've, I've been in it and stood on the second floor while the wind was moving at a foot either direction it's like being on the deck <laughs> of a ship uh, you know and rain coming in the roof through two stories it's uh it's one of the first locations uh haunted locations in the region that i had the opportunity to go to personally as in terms uh-huh. of going as a haunt, to a haunted location um incredible sensation i think it's worth bearing this may be our conclusion for tonight's show yeah. uh just uh incredible energy incredible location Mm-hmm. And lots and lots of reasons to have those sentient energies within the space. Yes. I mean, it was on the south end of the red light district. Um, and um, there was a mine shaft yards from the house that's filled in now uh, that, you know, bodies were recovered from. Um, yeah. And um there's, you know, a lot of consternation about whether or not it was involved with the infamous Staffelbat murders, and it mm-hmm. it was not directly that anyone knows of. Although um, the mine shaft nearby was where at least one of the bodies was disposed of, and other body parts uh, of other people, and um, certainly. Um, activity there indicates that people died there which of course yeah. certainly happened in sporting houses regardless um, yeah. and uh, but there's a number of evps of you know he killed me i must have died things like that um mm. sounds of slamming doors and what sounds like people being beat up, things like that. Um, and uh, the proximity, yeah, the proximity to the mining field, et cetera, that regardless of something happened directly there, certainly it could have been haunted by um, someone that met their ends in a mine shaft. Yes. And then to add, uh, layers of complexity of memory serves, there was a period mid-century that it was used as a nursing home. Yes, it was. Um, And so, yeah, we really don't know how many people really passed and and all the circumstances. Um, But, you know, certainly it it is one place that I've actually had people, investigators leave because they were so uncomfortable. Um, Yes. It's unusual for people to uh, get the sensation that they're drunk in Mm -hmm. in the house. Um, Doors opening on their own, shadow men appearing. It's the only place I've ever been that a shadow man actually ran at me, so. Yes, and. Shadow men usually run the other way. Yes. From people. One, One of 
I, I think my my primary takeaway, just in terms of impression, was uh, an abiding but indirect sense of anger. Yes, yes, there, there definitely, I think, is is someone there that is is very angry, um, either for being there or the the manner in which they left the world, um, et cetera, but it certainly comes through. It does, it does. And, and I wanna be very clear, it wasn't, there was, there was never a point that I felt in danger. There was never a point that I felt for myself during the night yeah. that I was there, uh, that, that that anger was being directed at me, but that I could tell that it was, it was there. Yeah, so just, just the overall atmosphere. Um, and like I said, I've had even investigators just leave because of the foreboding feelings they had, but I've never, I've never seen or heard of anyone actually attacked. Um, people have been touched. I had my butt slapped there <laughs> by someone unseen. Um, but, um, but that's as as, as angry as I know of things of that. Yes, yeah. yes. And a couple of times there's not when I was there, but recollections of uh, a black cloud manifesting at various yeah, places. Yes, there, there is yeah, a black dark. cloud that manifests on the, uh, on the second floor and particularly in the attic. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. it's, it's haunted. feel comfortable around. It is, it is haunted. I, it didn't bother me being there at night, um, but we were in a group. I mean, there was a number of us. Mm -hmm. I, it is a location that I, I would myself, I think be very uncomfortable there alone uh, at, at night. That's fair. I really, I really don't know anyone that really likes to be there alone. Any of the, any of the former caretakers or managers typically, uh, I mean, I have walked through the house alone at night, but yeah, yeah, I always feel like I'm definitely being watched. Um, the other manager, Linda, she certainly was the same way, and she, in fact, she would not go in it. She'd had enough experiences that she would not go in at night by herself. Yes. And I think for, for me also, and I, this isn't anything we've really talked about it. And again, it is, I think the, the, the value of impression, which you cannot objectively document. That's true. I mean, you can, um, yeah. you know, all I can say is this was my experience and you can say what your experience was, but to, to relay that, you know, I can, I can never say that someone else is going to say, okay, I, I know exactly what you mean. Right. So, so, I mean, I'm, that's my, that's my caveat. That's my disclaimer on this. Uh, but I remember the second night that we were there, uh, I went out front and walked a little ways down the, the road mm -hmm. in front. Mm -hmm. I know that there was a lot of things within proximity that occurred there. Some of which I know, I mean, very, concerning things other things you know that I simply don't know just you know can conjecture um it was for me it was more unsettling that was more unsettling and just a a, a sense of of energies within that space stretching out across the the that valley yeah that and that's, uh, very, I mean, that's very fair and you know yeah a lot, a lot of things happen right through there that, a lot of things and that would uh, take several shows to go into so <laughs> but uh, most of them mine related so there you go yeah most of them were <laughs> that may be a good good point to leave off tonight i think so it's been a great night this is a lot of fun it is uh, appreciate everyone and we will be back next week absolutely we'll see y'all soon